Now, behaviorism in the classroom, uh, as you are aware that many of the school's tradition drives or derives its strength from the behaviorist model uh, because from, from almost from the very beginning, many teachers or the, in, the rituals of education itself has rewarded the right behavior. So it's easy to condition people to participate by giving them the reward and so on and so forth. Now, the first thing is to use system of reward to encourage certain behaviors and learning. So you should start off by knowing your students and knowing what proper stimulus can be provided to make sure that they participate uh, wholeheartedly. When learning factual materials provide immediate and frequent feedback for complex and difficult concepts. See, because one of the things is students want to be assured that they are doing the right thing. That's part of their stimulus or, or gratification. So by, cons by quickly, by reducing the turnaround time of providing feedback really encourages learning. Recently, I had a conversation with, uh, with a colleague who teaches uh, at uh, A-levels. And he was telling how uh, in this notion the A-levels exams were very structured and, and many of the questions to, to give a proper model question that one needs to uh, teach substantial amount of knowledge before one could test because the, the notion of testing in A-levels is generally comprehensive. They integrate a few ideas together. So you need to wait, uh, uh, you need to go through a, a, a body of, a significant body of knowledge before a test is provided. Now, whereas the contradicting theory was not to wait for so long because people will, get, people will lose focus because they are not immediately gratified by, by positive feedback or responses to know which direction they are going. So the advice to this particular colleague was, was, to, was to think of feedback not from the exam perspective but feedback from the learning perspective. That means this is a body of knowledge that was learned and how feedback could be given immediately for this body of knowledge. The feedback and, and, and this gratification doesn't really need to be modeled from the exam perspective. But uh, of course, his, no, his particular uh, situation was much more complex because it is related to forecasting uh, learning and, and things like that. But generally, there is a notion that uh, feedback, it was, feedback is taken from the perspective of administrator's point of view. That means it's about exam quizzes for monitoring learning. Feedback must be now viewed from the learner's perspective, how it gratifies and promotes more learning. So there's a major paradigm shift from the notion of feedback. Now, provide practice, drill and review activities to enhance mastery of facts. Uh, there's this big notion of, of this new paradigm of PBL, like how when uh, many scholars or many academics talk about how their program introduces problem-based learning. They emphasize where learning, the environment of learning should be novel and, and people should participate in a, in a very meaningful, challenging way where they, they develop problem solving skills. Now, this is a completely a shift from, from this notion of practice drill and review. So, there should be a balance of giving practice drill and review to, to encourage or to engage students to become mas to to have a mastery of something because if every everything is on, on high end and problem solving and if you don't if, and it's not repetitive certain degree of mastery will not take place so for example if i was a, a, a math teacher i will start off by giving s certain degree of drills to master certain uh, techniques if the, the techniques are once mastered then we could move on to problem solving rather than straight away jumping to problem solving and then certain skills are not mastered effectively and then people have to keep reviewing and going back to rediscover those, those techniques. Like for example, if I had to learn to add fractions and I, I run drills repetitively how to add fractions very quickly, then the skills are taken for granted, subsequently can be taken for granted and we just dive into problem solving. Now, however, at least from a maths perspective, I would like to say that we shouldn't bore our students with drill and repetitive tasks because sometimes that's that's where students get killed. They need to see the meaning or, or the they need to have a feeling for what they are learning. So the right notion of mix and match, introducing real life problems to them to see connection between what the content they are learning and how it's connected to the real world, and also giving them space to drill and practice certain skills 
is uh, I think that's where the, uh, there's a difference between a good, excellent teacher and, 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 and a mediocre teacher. Now, break down complex tasks into smaller and man manageable subskills. Now, this is also related to the notion of feedback because if, if the task is number one overwhelming, the, in this case the, the stimulus is overwhelming, the response may not take place. So the first thing is the stimulus must be appropriate for a appropriate response and also from the motivational aspect in, in our talked about we just talked about how students are moving towards uh, favorable uh, experience and, and gratification. So the smaller chunks of information they do they feel uh, gratified every time they cross a particular subtask before you know they move and, and they could be eventually persuaded to 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 uh, learn a bigger body of knowledge or a bigger or to participate and solve a bigger task now sequencing materials to enhance understanding example teach simple concepts first before proceeding to more complex abstract form now this is really important because once again it comes back from stimulus you don't want the stimulus to overwhelm the response because the response then will not take place you must coerce the students to participating so you should reduce the risk initially. So in a, a good way to use this in class is, for example, if you ask a spontaneous question, that means you, you say, okay, you, uh, John, what is the answer for uh, Newton's third law? And then suddenly the student may stumble, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, the first thing you need to do is quickly, before the students uh, form a mental block uh, and, and, and out of embarrassment, to avoid embarrassment, he... The, he may respond in a way that is not favorable to you. To immediately jump and reduce the risk. You ask him things that you are sure that he will probably know the answer. And then lure him uh, a step higher and higher until you reach a, a terminal point where you understand that there is a gap. So it gives you an opportunity to fill the gap. Okay. And model behavior students, model the behavior students are to imitate and repeat demonstrate when necessary now once again I'm talking from personal experience um, in the field of uh, mathematics generally we would like to teach problem solving we would like to teach people to to discover mathematics but if you see the teacher walks into class he will not model this behavior uh, he will just start off writing down notes and the solution is in his hands and he will just copy it on the board and he will expect students to, to download it either from the traditional notion of download copying or the new notion of uh, pressing a button called download. So what the teacher needs to know is to model the behavior of a mathematician. That means to think aloud in front of the students. The students are aware. This is what I should be doing. Not just working a problem in a linear fashion. I should be uh, questioning the assumptions, questioning the steps, questioning whether the solution meets uh, the solution. I mean, the solution meets the uh, the solution is actually part of the question, and 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 think aloud throughout the process of solving that whether I'm going the right track. Because these are the real mathematical practices, and it's not modeled by the teacher. So if the teacher is not modeling. How would the student acquire this behavior? They may end up falsely believing that mathematics is just a logarithm, a step of algebraic steps that just follow one after another. And that's not true, right? Now, reinforce when students demonstrate modeled behavior. This is very important because uh, it, it coincides with all the three scholars that we talked about, about how certain behaviors lead towards pleasurable, uh, pleasurable feeling and emotion. And, and reinforce really helps. State the learning outcomes desired for the benefit of both teacher and student. So this is also important because student needs to know, a student wants to know where the end point is. So they can strive towards the end point. If the end, end point is ambiguous, then how would they know that they are uh, approaching what they are supposed to be approaching? Establish a contract with students on the work to be done and what rewards to be given. What rewards to be given. Now, this is uh, really crucial because as, as we talked about, you don't want to be the dog in the Pavlov experiment where things just happen to you, right? You may want to be uh, more involved in, in, in the way, uh, you want to be more involved the way Skinner talked about rather than Pavlov's dog. 
Okay. Then you know, want to talk about the notion of establish. Okay, that's the one we covered. And that's it. So these are the, the dimensions of how behaviorism is brought into the classroom. So once again, we talked about the three major scholars and, and, uh, and the whole notion of uh, behaviorism is, has two variables. The two principal behaviors are response and stimulus. So a stimulus is introduced and an and organism will respond to the stimulus. And how you orchestrate the stimulus may predict the the, the the quality of response to to the stimulus, and creating the right environment promotes the probably a more desirable response to a particular stimulus.